Hi everybody. Uh, before we get started, I need to have a little. I need to get a little bit of help with my green screen here. Hold on. Just hold on. Hold on a sec. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, this talk is called "Almost on Time." It's about JIT compiler basics. Uh, my name is Aaron Patterson. I'm also known on the internet as uh, Tenderlove. You can find me on Twitter or GitHub under that name. Uh, I work for a company called Shopify. I'm on the Rails infrastructure team. We're a pretty like uh, researchy team. Uh, we focus on we focus on performance of Ruby and Rails. Uh, we've been working on a JIT compiler called YJIT for uh, Ruby. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what I do. Um, I'm really excited to be speaking at Devs for Ukraine. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm so thankful that you all would have me. And I want I want to say thank you to everybody that's everybody that's watching this, this, especially if you have donated. So please donate. Uh, <laughs> so a little more, like a little more about me. Uh, I'm on the Rails core team. I'm one of the folks on the team that's responsible for the Rails Ruby on Rails framework. Uh, I work, do you know do work on the Rails framework itself. I've been on the Rails team for maybe ten years or so. I don't remember how long exactly. I'm also on the Ruby core team as well. Uh, our team is responsible for doing Ruby development or developing the Ruby language itself. Um, I bring this up because I, I want to say like I really really love Ruby I love the Ruby programming language I think it's really really great but uh, today I don't really want to talk about uh, the Ruby language so much as today I'd really like to talk about uh, JIT and JIT technology and there's definitely gonna be Ruby in in my examples like I'm gonna put Ruby in the examples but um, I hope that the things we're gonna talk about today will be useful in many different languages and not just Ruby, not just Ruby. Uh, I tried to design this talk to be like as if it was for me or something that I wanted um, some years ago. Like I, I think back on like, there was a time where I thought to myself, you know, JIT seems super cool, but how do I even like, how do I even get started on, on writing one? And I couldn't really find like a good tutorials online and I, I wanted to write this presentation as if I was giving it to myself uh, a few years ago before I knew before I knew this stuff. So uh, I hope that it will be helpful for you know people like me who who don't really know like what JIT compilers are or how to even get started writing one. So let's I mean let's get into it. Uh, what is a JIT compiler? I think is a basic question that that uh, people wonder and. The answer is quite simple. A JIT compiler is something that can assemble machine uh, machine code and execute it at runtime, and that's that's pretty much it. Like that is it. If it can put together machine code at runtime, it is it is a JIT compiler. And I think a really interesting example of this is metaprogramming in Ruby. Like we can think of a JIT compiler as very similar to metaprogramming. So in this example of code, we're, we're creating methods at runtime, we're creating Ruby methods at runtime, but instead of creating methods, we're actually gonna generate machine code and execute that machine code. So rather than, you know, rather than making methods, we're gonna make machine code, and that is our, that is, I think, I guess that would be the difference, is that a JIT will make machine code. And the interesting thing is, this isn't specific to just one particular language. You can write a JIT compiler in any language that you want to, as long as you can put together bytes into a string. Like, if you can put bytes into a string, you can write a JIT compiler in that language. But today, we're not going to be writing out just, like, random bytes to a string. Like, I don't... I mean, maybe that would be helpful for cryptography or something, but I don't think it's going to be super helpful with a, with a JIT compiler. Uh, so we're not going to do, we're not going to just write out random bytes. Instead, what we're going to do is I want to take a uh, Ruby code and I want to convert that Ruby code into machine code. So how do we get there? Like what, you know, the first, I think the first question that we need to answer is, you know, what kind of tools do we need in order to do this? And I think that there are like three, three basic things that we need, only three basic things we need to write a JIT compiler. 
Uh, the first one is we need a way to allocate memory. So we need some method for allocating memory. And it can't just be any memory, it has to be executable memory. So we need a way to allocate executable memory. Uh, the second piece of the puzzle is we need a way to assemble code or assemble machine code and put it into this executable memory. Um, and the third thing that we need is we need a way to, to actually jump into that executable memory so that we can execute it. It's not good enough to just assemble the bytes together. We have to be able to jump into those, jump into those assembled bytes and have the machine actually execute those assembled bytes. So for allocation, uh, I wrote a gem called the JIT buffer gem. Right now, it only works on Mac OS. Like theoretically, so <laughs> theoretically, this gem is supposed to be a cross-platform JIT buffer object, but right now it only works on Mac OS, and that's because I just haven't done the work to make it work on other platforms. But it it should work fine. We just need to do the work for those platforms, which I will do at some point. Um, but yeah, the JIT, this is an example of using the JIT buffer gem. Basically, we just create a new buffer of a particular size. We mark it as writable, and then we can write any data to it that we want to, and then we can mark it as executable again. And it works like you can treat it just like an I.O. object. The only difference is that this I.O. object is working with um, executable memory. And because of system, like the, the writable and executable methods are kind of weird, but we need those because of uh, system level protections. So like Mac OS and other um, like BSD, those operating systems won't allow you to have uh, memory be executable and writable at the same time as a, as a security precaution. So you have to either be writable or executable. You can't be both at the same time. So I provided methods for you to toggle between the two. So the next thing that you need is an assembler. And we have a couple choices here. Uh, I wrote one gem called ARH64, which is an assembler for ARM64 processors or FISC, which is an assembler for x86 processors. So you have to select the one that you're targeting for the platform that you're targeting. Uh, in these like in these slides, I'm going to be using the ARH64 gem, and that's because I'm I'm on a Mac, and I have it's an M1. It has an ARM64 processor, and that's what I'm like that's what I've been working with. Here's an example of using it. In this in this example, we're just putting together two instructions. Uh, it's the MOVZ X0, we're putting the number 42 into the X0 register, and then the second instruction, the RET instruction, is just saying, hey, I want you to return from this subroutine. So we're putting 42 into the return location, and then we're saying, hey, please, please return from, from this subroutine. And then we can ask the assembler, like, hey, can you write yourself out to this buffer? So we can hand it a buffer. The buffer could be a string or the buffer could be a file, but actually what would be really more useful is if the buffer is our JIT buffer, and that's the next example here, is we, we take that assembler, we combine it with the JIT buffer, and then we write the, we ask the assembler, hey, write all those bytes into the, into the JIT buffer. So we have two of the things that we need, and the third thing we need is a way to execute this memory. So we have our, we have our bytes written to memory, and we'd really like to execute it now. The way we execute it is with a gem called Fiddle. It is another gem that I wrote. Uh, it ships with Ruby, and it's just a lib FFI wrapper. And I want to show an example of calling a function with Fiddle. Uh, in this case, we're calling the Sterling function, and we need to, like, first we get the address of the Sterling function, then we create a function object that wraps the Sterling function. And to make that function object, we have to provide three things. We give it the function address, uh, we give it the parameter types, in this case a void pointer, because we're doing, it's a str strlen, we're measuring the length of the string, and the return value, we have to say that it's going to return an integer. Now, uh, what's really interesting about this is, I said earlier, we're giving this function object an address, like we give it an address to jump to and execute. And what's kind of cool is that fiddle slash libffi don't really care like they don't care what that address is they just jump to that address and start executing it uh, so we can give it any old address that we want to and what we can do is we can say hey i want the address of that executable memory that jip buffer i'd like you to jump into that jip buffer rather than the sterling function so here's an example of all three combined we have the uh ARCH64 gem with the JIT buffer gem with fiddle. So we put all these together. First, we assemble some machine code. We say, hey, I want, I want you to execute the or create these 
uh, this machine code. We write that machine code out to an executable buffer. We create a new fiddle object where we say, hey, um, I would like you to, we create a new fiddle object and we give the fiddle, the function object, the address of the executable, mem executable memory. And finally, we just say, hey, call, I'm gonna call you. I want you to jump in and start executing. So if we look at the, if we look at the machine code that we assembled, we see, hey, we're moving 42 into the return register and then we're just returning. And you can see when we call the function with func.call down at the bottom, it gets the number 42 back. So we were able to successfully uh, put together machine code at runtime and execute that machine code all at runtime. So we can say that this is, this is our first JIT. So we can take all that stuff, put it together at runtime and execute it. We, we've, we've checked all the boxes for what is a JIT and we, we did it. Um, but there's kind of a weird thing if you look at this code, like here's an example, like here's, here's the code that we wrote at the very top of the script. Um, if I were to write this code in assembly language, like if I were to write an assembly language script, it would look like this. And it's true that yes, indeed, we did write pure Ruby. That's really great. Uh, but this pure Ruby looks very, very similar to assembly code. And I don't know about like you, but you know, do you want to be writing assembly code? I certainly don't. No, we don't want to, we don't want to be writing assembly code. Rather, what we'd prefer to do is have like some sort of translation process where we give some function, we say, hey, I want you to, I want you to take this Ruby code and I want you to convert this Ruby code into machine code for me. So it'd be nice if we had some way to like translate the Ruby code into machine code for us automatically. And that's generally what we think of as, as a JIT more, I guess, more advanced JIT. Um, so I wanna talk about this translation process because I wanna take some Ruby code and I wanna convert that Ruby code into, into machine code. Uh, and honestly, the basic idea that we're gonna walk through here doesn't have to be, like it's not limited to just Ruby. We can do this, we can do this with any language that we want to, uh, but I'm gonna use Ruby as the example here. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna have to write a parser and compiler for Ruby. And the answer to that is no, we are not going to do that. And the reason we are not going to do that is because it is way too hard and I am way too lazy. <laughs> Ruby has a perfectly good parser and compiler and we can leverage those instead of writing our own, writing our own. And the output of that parser and compiler is actually Ruby bytecode. So what we would like to do is instead of, instead of like taking all the complexities of the, of the grammar of the language and compiling all that, instead what we'd like to do is take the very simple, the simple machine instructions, the bytecode, and write a converter that can take that bytecode, convert that bytecode into machine language. So to do that, we need to know a little bit more about machines. So I wanna talk about the two different types of machines that we have to deal with today. Uh, there's two different types of machines that you'll encounter, and those are stack machines and register machines. And stack machines are pretty popular for virtual machines. That's because they're very easy to implement in software. Uh, register machines are very common for hardware, but you'll see them. They're common for hardware because they're easy to implement with hardware, but you'll also see uh, register machines in virtual machines as well. So some examples of stack machines uh, Yarv, which is the one where Ruby's virtual machine, that's the one that we're going to be messing with today. It's a stack machine. C Python uses a stack machine. Uh, Sun's JVM also uses a stack machine. Uh, examples of register machines. The V8, V8's virtual machine uses a register machine. And your ARM processor or your Intel processor, the x86 processor, those are register machines, but they're hard, examples of hardware, hardware register machines. So let's take a look at how stack machines work. So we need to understand how the stack machine works so that we can take Ruby's stack machine and convert that into the uh, machine code, which into a, like a, a register machine, which our, which our hardware actually uses. So uh, if you've ever used an HP calculator, this will be very familiar. There's probably like, I don't know, two people maybe two people watching this that have used HP calculators. I used an HP calculator in high school and I loved it. But if you've used one of these calculators, you'll know, you already know this process. Um, but basically 
Ruby, what it does, it takes a source, your source code, and when you run a program, it takes your source code and it converts that source code into YARV instructions. And the virtual machine will execute, execute those instructions. And those instructions manipulate a stack. And this is a, here's kind of an example. Say we have this function adder. This function adder gets converted into these compiled instructions. And I want to run through these instructions so we can get kind of an idea of how they manipulate the stack. Uh, after they've been converted into, after they've been converted into, or the code's been converted into instructions, the virtual machine will interpret them and manipulate the stack. Now there's two important components of the virtual machine. The first one is the program counter, uh, or the PC, which you see in blue here. The program counter points at the uh, next instruction that we'll execute. And then we also have the SP, or stack pointer, and that points at where we're going to uh, write to next. So when we execute an instruction, or when the virtual machine executes an instruction, first it pushes the PC forward and then executes whatever it was on. So in this example, first we'll push the PC forward, then it'll execute the put object instruction, which pushes a three onto the stack. Next, we'll do the same thing. We'll push the PC forward. This one pushes a five onto the stack. Uh, then the next thing we'll do is we'll execute the plus instruction, and the plus instruction is a little bit different. It pops two values off of the stack, adds them together, and then pushes the return value back onto the stack. So when we execute this, it'll pop five, pop three, and then it'll push eight again. Then finally, the leave instruction will just return whatever, whatever value is at the top of the stack, it just returns that. So we can think of the stack as kind of an infinitely long array, and it's very nice to implement like, it's nice to implement a stack-based virtual machine because we can just manipulate this infinitely long array. We just push and pop values on, on and off of the stack. It's pretty easy. Now, we'll contrast that with register machines. Let's take the same code, like, same Ruby code, and imagine that we had a compiler that converted this Ruby code into machine code. The machine code might look something like this, where uh, the instructions are on, the machine code instructions are on the right, and if we kind of imagine how this is executed inside the machine. Uh, our computer also has a PC as well, and it does the same thing. It points at the next instruction that's going to execute. So in this case, we say, hey, I'm gonna move the, I'm gonna copy the value three into the X0 register. So first we'll push it forward. It puts three into the X0 register. We do the same thing here. We'll say we're gonna put the number five into the X1 register. And then the add instruction takes two registers and it says, hey, I'm gonna take these two registers, I'm gonna add them together, and then I'm gonna clobber whatever was in the register on the left. So in this case, we're gonna take X0, add it to X1, and then the return value of that is gonna be in the X0 register. So when we execute this, three and five get added together, and then eight is written into the X0 register. And an interesting thing is that, like, the X1 register doesn't get cleared. Whatever value was in that register when we did the add, it's still gonna be there after we did the add. So it, it doesn't actually clear any data out there. And finally, we just return. So uh, to compare this with our stack-based machines, we have to deal with a, register machines have to deal with a fixed number of registers, and the instructions have to specify which registers they're manipulating. Now, stack machines don't have to specify registers because they know that they're just manipulating a stack. So you can kind of see how this is, how it's much easier to implement a stack machine. You can think of a stack machine as a register machine, but with an infinite number of registers. Unfortunately, real machines have a finite number of registers, so we have to deal with that. Now, we're gonna do some conversion. Now that we know how both these types of machines work, we just have to write some code that performs a conversion from one type of machine to another. But before we can do this conversion, we have to somehow access the instructions that the Ruby VM uses. Fortunately, there's an API for doing that, and that's the Ruby VM instruction sequence class. Uh, we can take this class and say, hey, I want you to access the instructions for a particular method. In this example, we're disassembling the adder function, and if we look at the output, we see very similar, like it's very similar to the examples that we saw earlier. The instructions just say, okay, I want you to push three onto the stack, then push five onto the stack, then I want you to pop the two off and add the results. Then finally, whatever is on the top of the stack, I just want you to return that value. And we can actually get the instructions back as an array. We can ask this, this uh, iSeq object, we can say, hey, can you convert yourself into an array, please? 
And I know that the, like the output of this looks really, really messy, but you don't need to read it. It's not super important what's written here. The important part is that we can actually programmatically access these uh, byte codes or these instructions. And since we can programmatically access them, that means that we can write a converter. So to write a converter, we need to, we create a class which is called essentially a virtual stack. And this virtual stack, it maps uh, the stack into registers. So here's an example of using it. The stack helps us convert the pushes and pops of a, of a stack into machine registers. On the left is the implementation, on the right is the usage. When we push a value onto the virtual stack, the virtual stack tells us what register we should write to. And when we pop a value off of the virtual stack, the virtual stack tells us what register we should read from. So we can see that in, in action. Here's an example. Uh, at the top, we have the, the VM instructions from our sample method, this adder method. Below, we have a loop that processes each one of those instructions. And we use this virtual stack object to process them, pretending as if we're manipulating a real stack, when in fact, the virtual stack is just telling us which registers we need to read and write from as we're, as we're generating, generating the machine code. So to zoom in a little bit, like let's take a look at this put object instruction. Here we say, hey, I want to push an object onto the stack. Like I want to push some value onto the stack. Where should I write that? And then we, we push that. The stack tells us where to write it. And then we tell the assembler, hey, I would like to write a value into this register. So we write to that particular location. Now, in the example of the uh, add instruction here, we say, hey, I need to pop two values off the stack. Where should I read those two values? So we say pop, pop, and then we add the values together. So we add those two values together. And then finally we say, hey, we need to push the result of that onto the stack. Where should I write that? So we, pu we call push on the virtual stack and then we write to the location. Finally, uh, the leave instruction, we just pop the last value off the stack, put it into the special return register, and then we return. So uh, if we run this code and disassemble the generated machine instructions, it'll look something like this. So on the left is our, our conversion function, and on the right is the machine code that we generated. Now, if we take this, this loop here and these processes and extract them out into a function, we can write something that looks like this, where we say, hey, I'm gonna give you, we have this, we have this function called make function, and we say, hey, I'm gonna give you a JIT buffer, and I'm gonna give you a method object, and I want you to convert the instructions from the JIT buffer, or from that method object, into machine code, and dump that into the JIT buffer. So taking exactly the code we saw on that previous slide, extracting it to a function, we're able to get this machine code back out on the other side and execute it as well. So we've successfully been able to convert a Ruby, like a regular old Ruby function into machine code using pure Ruby. So we've written really our first real JIT. Like this is, I mean, I guess the previous JIT was, it was also a real JIT, but this one's taking code that like, we would want to write, like we want to write Ruby code or we want to write Python. We take that code we want to write and we convert that code into machine code. Now there's a few performance improvements we could do. Uh, for example, in this, in this particular example, we wrote a really simple translator. And uh, the thing is like, we've got this machine code as output, but just because we wrote machine code doesn't mean that it's fast necessarily. So can we make this machine code smaller? And we actually can. You'll see there's two instructions here. When we do the add, we say, hey, I wanna add, and then I'm gonna write. So I'm gonna add the two values, and then I'm going to uh, write the result of that add to, to this virtual stack, which is actually a machine register. Now you'll notice uh, on the ARM instruction set, most of the, like, most of the instructions take triples, so they'll, they'll take three registers. And what this is actually saying is, it's saying, hey, I want you to add x1 and x2, and I want you to write the return value of that to x3. What that means is when we add stuff together, we can actually do the add and the write in one, one instruction rather than two. So in order to support that, what we do is we refactor our plus handling code. When we do a, instead of doing an add and then a, and then a write, we say, hey, I'm gonna pop twice to understand where we need to read the two values, and then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna push once so I know where to write the result value. And then I add those together. So we say, hey, add, here's the write location, and I want you to write the addition of these two registers into that write, into that write location. So if we make that simple little change, we'll see that we end up with better, like better machine code as output. We have one fewer instruction. 
The other thing that we can do is we can teach types to this virtual stack. Like in this case, we are pushing integer literals onto the stack. When we push those literals onto the stack, we can say, hey, virtual stack, I'm pushing an integer literal. So we'll push the int literal five and we'll push the int literal three. And why would we wanna do this? Uh, the reason we'd wanna do this is because, for example, in this opt plus instruction where we're popping the two values off, we can look at the types and say, oh, you know, those types, those two are actually integers. They're just integers. So rather than doing like, uh, like rather than, you know, doing an add instruction, I'm going to do the add at compile time and then just do a write. So we can do the three plus five uh, add at compile time and we'll end up with machine code like on the right where we say like, hey, I just want you to write the number eight into this register now. I don't need you to do an add. I'm just going to write, write the number eight. What's interesting about this is we're essentially doing a calculation at compile time and we're caching the results of that calculation into the machine code itself. And this can get a lot more interesting when we're caching values of say like, I don't know, other computations, like maybe we want to, we want to cache an object's location or the, I don't know, computations of other things that we can understand at compile time. Now, another thing that we can do is, well, we know like uh, we're not actually using these, this uh, three and the five, those two instructions at the top, they're not actually necessary anymore because we compiled the two, we calculated those, the, that ad in advance. So we can, we can remove those, those two uh, writes. Um, now there's a, there's some further challenges that I, I, you know, want to talk about here. Like, we, we've been able to write a JIT compiler and I want to talk about kind of the challenges like going forward. Like let's say we were going to, we were going to take this JIT compiler and we're going to do it for real. We're going to write a really great, really great JIT compiler. One, one of the issues is, well, we, we only implemented three instructions. We implemented put object, we implemented plus, and we implemented leave. So we only did those three instructions. Unfortunately in uh, YARV there's 202 instructions. So we would, if we're going to support all Ruby code, we have to be able to we have to be able to su like support all of those instructions. Uh, but I mean, it's not such a big deal because like not all Ruby code uses all instructions, so maybe only implement the most popular ones. But I think a more like difficult thing is what about weird code? So let's let's take some weird code. For example, let's say we have an adder function like this. Um, like somebody we we say like hey. We're going to do a three plus five. We're going to convert that into machine code. And when we do that, like after we've converted it into machine code, somebody monkey patches plus. Now we have to say, hey, machine code, I need you to be invalidated. Like, how do we deal? How do we deal with this? So, all right, so let's wrap this up. Uh, we talked about what a JIT is along with the three basic uh, parts required to write one. Uh, which are those three basic components are we need something to allocate memory, specifically executable memory. Uh, we need something to assemble machine code together and write it into that executable memory. And then finally, we need to be able to execute that memory. We need a way to hop into it and let that executable memory run. Uh, we were able to write a basic JIT that just uh, returned a number. So it, it just assembled very simple instructions and returned a number. And finally, we were able to write a very simple compiler, which would take regular Ruby code as input and produce machine code as output. So I think, like, I really, really hope that by the end of watching this, everybody who is thinking, what is a JIT has gone from, you know, what, what is a JIT? I'm not sure how, what this thing is to, I can write a JIT. Uh, and even if you don't write a complete JIT, at least you'll still be almost on time. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy I could be here and part be part of this. Uh, thank you for having me. All right, let's uh, put this uh, green screen away now. All right, thank you, thank you. <laughs>